All right, so for chapter eight, we're going to be looking at environmental health and toxicology, essentially just seeing um, sort of some of the different factors that are going to influence how these chemicals move through the, um, the different environment, uh, the different pieces of the environment even, um, including different organisms. Uh, and then with the, the start of this chapter, I'm just going to ask that you read um, section 8.1 on your own. Uh, I'm not going to cover it in the lecture just because the the previous couple of modules have been pretty lengthy in, some, in terms of the the lectures so this one i'm going to cut, try to keep a little bit shorter um, and some of that stuff is probably more familiar to you from previous like biology classes and uh, things like that than some of the the other material that we're going to cover but if you do have any questions on any of that of course just let me know and we can discuss it um, anytime during office hours um, but with this chapter we're going to be looking at uh, the the movement of these chemicals throughout the environment um, and essentially what we're going to be thinking about is toxicology and specifically environmental toxicology. So like you can see in the, the image on the bottom, um, that's going to be a, uh, a combination of environmental chemistry, toxicology, and then ecology. So we're going to be kind of wrapping all of those together. Um, and then there'll be other factors, uh, of course, will be um, just mostly focused on those three. We can kind of think of those as the, the main three sort of pillars of environmental toxicology. Um, and with this, we're focused mostly on sort of the, the adverse effects that are going to be experienced by the, the different organisms that are exposed to these different toxins in the environment. Um, but we're also going to be interested in the, the movement and the ultimate fate of these chemicals. Um, and then with this, I talked about it a little bit in the, the previous chapter um, with the, the, special, uh, the special topics lecture, the one focused on pesticides uh, the, the and environmental fate model looking at sort of the, the volatilization, which was just evaporation, um, photodegradation, and then we saw some of the other processes just briefly mentioned, like runoff, and we'll look at those uh, today as well, or in this one as well. Um, but just to, to start to give us a little bit of a background, just um, for a, a definition, toxins, we're just gonna simply um, categorize as any sort of substance that's going to, to damage or kill living organisms by disrupting those metabolic functions. And then with this quote here, you may have seen it in a couple different forms. Uh, I've seen it kind of jumbled up and written in a couple of different ways, but it's always saying basically the same thing. Um, poison is in everything and no thing is without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. Um, so with that, you can kind of think about thalidomide. You may be uh, familiar with that from uh, history class. In adults, Thalidomide can help treat certain types of cancer, can help with uh, leprosy. Um, but then in pregnant women, they gave it to them to, to treat um, morning sickness. But what it also wound up causing was um, uh, birth defects in those, uh, the, the, the children. Uh, and then similarly, with, we, we can also think about uh, just something as simple as water. Depending on the, the dose, depending on how much of it we're exposed to, it can either be something that we need to, to survive or it can be something that can kill you. So you can't actually drink too much water, essentially sort of drown your cells. Um, and in that case, water is gonna be a toxic uh, substance, but if it's just a, a general cup of water, something that's gonna be a more normal dose, uh, gonna be totally harmless, as long as there's nothing else um, in there. Which is with the, the different types of toxins, we're gonna to see different types of responses within those different organisms. So an allergen is just gonna be something that simply causes an immune response. Um, so the, the textbook mentioned um, the sick building syndrome is where the, the different, uh, where it's just poor circulation. So you're getting sort of a, a higher concentration of some of those, those allergens. It's gonna cause uh, headaches um, and just different symptoms like that. And then neurotoxins are gonna be more, um, more severe generally, these are going to attack nerve cells. Uh, so this is going to be things like heavy metals, so lead, arsenic, um, chlorinated hydrocarbons, and organophosphates. So a lot of pesticides are going to fall into this group as well. Um, and then with these, part of the reason they're good pesticides is because this is what we want them to do, at least with the, the chlorinated hydrocarbons and organophosphates. Uh, you don't really use heavy metals as a, a pesticide. Um, but they attack the nerve cells in those pests, whatever we're trying to target, but they're um, also gonna cause similar effects in just non-target organisms as well. So we're gonna see um, if humans are exposed, not to the same extent, obviously, as the, the pests, but we will see negative effects with those for, for a similar reason. 
Um, mutagens are just going to be anything that causes a mutation, so anything that just alters the DNA. And with this, it can be um, a chemical or it can just be radiation. So if you think about um, solar radiation has the ability um, to damage your DNA, that would be considered a mutagen. Uh, teratogens. Um, these are going to be a little bit unique in the, the sense that they're only going to cause um, abnormalities in um, specific cases. So if you think about alcohol, uh, obviously there's going to be negative health, uh, health effects with alcohol consumption, but it's not going to be um, sort of in the, the moment really much of a, a toxin. But for pregnant women, it's going to disrupt the, the fetus growth. Um, so that's why it's going to be a teratogen. And then carcinogens are just going to be anything that's going to um, potentially cause cancer. And then with these substances, if you go on the, the EPA website, you can find um, just all information about a whole bunch of different ones, um, just information about harmful substances in general, um, because the, the EPA is going to be what the, the, the regulatory body that's really focused on um, monitoring these substances throughout the, the environment. Um, and then one other type of um, toxin or compound that you, you may come across is an endocrine hormone disruptor. Um, and then these, you may have, without even sort of knowing that you've heard about these, you may have heard about them before. Um, if you're familiar with, um, uh, what's that dude's name? Um, Alex Jones, the, he runs InfoWars or whatever that stupid website is. Um, he said the, the government's making um, frogs gay. The, the reason he said that is because these chemicals are in the um, getting into the water sometimes. Obviously that statement's just idiotic. Uh, there's no chemical that can make a human or any other organism gay or straight or anything else. Um, so that's just an example that just because somebody's loud and has a platform doesn't mean that they're right. Um, but the, the basis of what he's saying does come from um, science in the, the sense that the, the chemicals that he's referring to, stuff like PCB, so the stuff that the General Electric Company dumped in the Hudson River, BPA, bisphenol A, um, is used in plastic sometimes to, to harden the plastic to make it a, a better product. Um, that one may have actually been banned, I'm not totally sure, I can't remember. DDT we've talked about a couple times, um, but that's the, the chemical that was responsible for the, um, the death of a lot of birds at the, the top of their, um, their food web ultimately helped lead to the, the writing of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson and then the uh, establishment of the, the US EPA. Um, but with these chemicals, the, the reason um, he was saying that is because they, they're sometimes known as xenoestrogens. And then um, xeno, the prefix just means foreign. Um, so it's a xenoestrogen just, just because it's going to, to mimic an estrogen um, molecule but it's gonna be produced, it's gonna come from somewhere outside of your body. Um, but you can kind of see what's gonna occur in this image. It's gonna be able to bind with that estrogen receptor because it's gonna be able, it's gonna sort of, it's gonna mimic it, it's gonna seem very similar. So we're gonna wind up getting ultimately the same response. And then estrogen is just the, the female sex hormone, testosterone is the, the male sex hormone. Um, so what can happen is you'll see uh, in females, you'll see reproductive issues just because now they're gonna have too much of this response. And then in um, men, you can sometimes see feminization just because now you're gonna start to, to have this response um, occur more than it should, or more than it naturally should, I should say. Um, so again, with the, the Alex Jones thing, what he was actually saying, totally idiotic. Um, but like with most uh, stupid conspiracy theories, they do have like one very small sort of basis in reality. Um, and that's just going to be that these, these uh, chemicals are xenoestrogens. Uh, but then with the, the government aspect of it, he was claiming that the government was dumping them in. Um, like I said, PCBs came from General Electric. PBA is just used in plastic a whole bunch, so a whole bunch of different companies, a whole bunch of different uses. Um, and then DDT was just a pesticide that was used a long time ago um, to help prevent malaria. And then when they found out kind of what the, the issues were, they stopped using it because uh, that's going to be a uh, chemical that doesn't break down, all three of these actually. Uh, but in addition to sort of the, the, the disruption of the, um, with the, the estrogen receptors, 
Um, what you can also see is issues with the, the metabolism and energy story, uh, energy storage, eh, energy storage mechanisms. There we go. Um, and what that can also cause is obesity and diabetes. Um, so like from the, the last chapter, we talked about how the, um, the, the number of uh, obese people overweight is increasing. Part of it may also be somewhat related to this. But like I said multiple times with uh, different chapters, um, there's always gonna be a whole bunch of different factors in all of these sort of environmental science related issues. Um, and then for the, the next part of this chapter, what we're gonna be focused on now is what these chemicals are actually doing, how they're actually moving throughout the environment. Um, and what we can do is just a, a quick example is look at um, just if we had a, something like an oil spill uh, in the, some sort of marine environment. Um, so it happens, unfortunately, quite a bit in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you may have seen examples up in near Alaska and things like that. Um, but because of the, the properties of oil and water, they're not actually going to mix. So that's why we tend to see the, the oil go to the, the very surface and then just kind of spread out on top of that rather than actually sort of mix in with the, the water. Um, it's going to be due to the, the solubility, the polarity of those two. They're just not going to be miscible. Um, similar to just with, uh, what's the, the type of salad dressing? Italian dressing, I think it is, whatever the one that you, you mix up. Um, but once we have these chemicals in the, the environment, it doesn't have to be oil, uh, oil slick, could be, any, or oil just in general, could be any chemical, but we're going to be um, exposing them to these different processes. So again, just like we talked about in the, the pesticide little uh, video, photodegradation, the, the sunlight, the energy of those photons can actually break down the, the chemicals in some cases. That's going to transform it into something new, maybe more toxic, maybe less toxic, but it's going to have some sort of um, some different set of properties. Uh, depending on the, the chemical, depending on the, the temperature, it may evaporate into the atmosphere and then it can move around um, just based on sort of the, the wind. Um, and then it can also transform based on the, the sunlight in the atmosphere. If we spill it into the water, it can be transported just in that water, um, meaning it can move to the, the shore. Or if we see here, um, it can just undergo sedimentation where it's just going to ultimately settle at the, the bottom of the, uh, the lake or river, whatever it is. Um, and then with these, we also have uh, biological processes. So in some cases, microbes or, or just other microorganisms may be involved in actually transforming these into something else. Um, or they may actually just be uptaken by some sort of plant, some sort of organism, and then they're going to be stored in the, the cells. Um, they may be metabolized depending on what it is. Um, they may be excreted depending on what it is. Uh, but with the, uh, the movement, the distribution and fate, ultimately what we're just considering is the, the sum total of all of these different processes, sort of whatever the um, the, the life cycle of that chemical is just, it's going to be whatever it undergoes in the environment. Um, and then again, it will be dependent, uh, on what chemical it is, because that's going to give it different properties. So that might make it more, um, more likely to move into the gas phase, more likely to stay in the, the liquid phase. Maybe it's going to settle as a solid, um, may make it more susceptible to photodegradation may be more likely to bioaccumulate, which we'll talk about. Um, and then it's also gonna be dependent on the environment that it's in, depending on what the, the qualities of this water are, depending on what the qualities of the air it's in, the temperature, the, the other things it's mi uh, mixed with, all those, all those different factors are going to, to impact um, the, the fate, the distribution of these chemicals. And then the, the first thing that we wanna focus on is the, the solubility. And then with this, we're going to have two main classes. So water soluble, meaning that it's going to be something that generally will dissolve in water. And then substances like uh, oil, stuff that won't dissolve in water is going to be fat soluble. Um, and the, the, the other term for that is going to be hydrophobic. So if you just think about phobia as being a fear of something, so hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic fear of water. Um, and then one thing to note about these is the, the water soluble chemicals. If they're, um, if they're absorbed, if they're ingested, inhaled by a, an organism, they're typically going to be excreted fairly quickly. And they're also going to move throughout the environment fairly, uh, fairly readily, just because water is going to be present in most uh, places in the environment. 
it's going to be present in most organisms. So it's going to be able to pretty much just dissolve and move across different membranes, um, move to different sort of areas almost, if you want to think about it that way. Whereas the, the fat soluble substances, those are actually going to wind up collecting in the, the fatty tissues and they're actually going to store there. They're actually going to wind up um, accumulating as we'll see in a couple of slides. Um, and then because of that, the, the water soluble ones, you're going to notice a deficiency in those much quickly, much quicker, because those are going to be the ones that you're um, constantly going to be excreting. So those are going to be the ones that you pretty much have to constantly be replenishing. Whereas the, the fat soluble ones, those are the ones that are going to be stored. So if you start running, um, if you're not, if you're no longer ingesting those, if it's something like a vitamin, something that we want to actually keep in our body, um, it'll take longer for you to actually notice that you uh, are deficient in those just because you will sort of have a, um, a storage of them from the, the previous uh, intake. And then because of that, uh, since the, the water soluble ones are the ones that you're constantly excreting, typically those are gonna be uh, less common just because you're gonna be the, uh, like commonly excreting them. And again, in this case, we're thinking more in the sense of vitamins, which again, anything can be toxic depending on the, the dosage. Um, so if you have too much of a, a vitamin or a mineral, it can be bad. That's gonna be less of an issue with these water soluble vitamins and minerals just because your body's gonna constantly be um, excreting them. Whereas the, the fat soluble ones, they have the ability um, to, to sort of accumulate. So they have the ability um, or they are, they're more likely uh, to potentially be toxic just because they're more likely to actually build up to a higher concentration. And then in addition to, to solubility, what we want to think about as well is the, the persistence of these chemicals. Because once they're in the environment, like we saw with the, the image there, they're going to be exposed to sunlight, they're going to be exposed to the atmosphere or water, um, they're going to be exposed to a whole um, just set of environmental conditions. And if it's a chemical that's going to quickly break down, it's not one that we're going to have to worry about too much, just because it's not going to be in the environment too much or too long. It's not going to be really able to be exposed to too much. Um, and that's with the, the assumption that it's going to, to break down into something less, less toxic. In some cases, that's not true. Some cases it could break down into something more toxic. Um, so we also would hopefully have some sort of understanding of the, the degradation process so we can kind of figure that out. Um, but for the, the persistent chemicals, the reason that those are going to be an issue is because they're just going to be the, the chemicals that aren't actually going to break down at all. They're going to be what are sometimes known as forever chemicals. Um, and then in the, the first discussion post, you have to do a, a current event. Um, I posted a, a current event related to, to PFAS. That's just a, a class of compounds um, that are used in a, a whole bunch of consumer products. And they just never break down in the environment, or at least for a very, very long time, they don't break down. Um, and that's why these persistent chemicals, even the ones that haven't been used in decades, can still be uh, found in the environment. Um, they can still be found in the, the blood of most humans. Um, so a lot of these persistent chemicals, they're so persistent that even if they're, they're no longer around or no longer being used, they're still at concentrations that can be measured in human blood just because we're constantly being exposed to them still. Um, and then with these, uh, there's a, a special class of them just known as the, the persistent organic pollutants. Um, and then combined with the, the heavy metals, so stuff like mercury, lead, um, that's, that's what we're looking at here. This isn't a, a full list of the persistent organic um, pollutants, um, but these are just some of the ones that are highlighted on the, the EPA website. And again, these include the, the heavy metals, they include some pesticides, they include some um, chemicals that are used in consumer products like PFAS, um, but they all are similar in the sense that they're not gonna break down in the environment. And then since they don't break down in the environment, and since they're, uh, that makes them susceptible to being able to travel to pretty much every location, because if they're not gonna break down, they're gonna be, they're going to have sort of a, a massive uh, lifetime. So they're going to have plenty of time to just move everywhere. And because of that, we actually see these substances present in pretty much the, the blood of every human being. Um, so 3M is one of the, the companies that started making PFAS chemicals. 
um, or at least profitably the most from it. So things like Teflon, Gore-Tex, um, stuff like that. And then they measured the uh, concentration of these chemicals in the, the blood of their workers. They tried to get a sort of a clean control group. Um, and the, the only way they could do that, even after going to outside of the, the workers, going outside of their families, outside of that community, outside of the country even, the, the only way they were able to find a, a sample of clean blood um, was actually actually to get frozen, um, frozen samples of blood from uh, many decades previous before these chemicals were, were used widely. Um, because at this point, they're just so ubiquitous, ubiquitous, they're so widespread throughout the environment that they, they are present in pretty much everybody's blood. And then with environmental toxicology, we, all, we want to think about exposure. Um, and that's going to come into play in a couple of different areas in terms of um, how we handle a hazard. And by that, I mean, if the, the potential for exposure is greater, we're going to we're going to have a, a higher sense of caution. We're going to be more careful in that situation. Um, but we also want to think about the, the the route of exposure. The the way that chemical is being introduced uh, to us is going to be important. And that's going to be because the the way it's introduced um, is going to sort of impact the the level of the, the effects. And then typically when we see this inhalation, so breathing in a substance, is going to have a, a quicker, more severe reaction to that toxin than just ingesting it, so swallowing it, so eating or drinking, whatever that may be. Uh, and then absorbing it just through the, the skin is typically going to be the slowest. And then the, the reason for that is because when you inhale it, it's getting deep into your lungs. It's going to be easier to for the that substance to be exchanged in your lungs than any other substance or any other location in your body, um, at least compared to eating it, which now you're going to, um, you may get some exchange sort of through the, the membranes in your, your mouth. Um, and then when it gets to your stomach, now you're actually going to have to digest it. So it's going to be a little bit slower of a process. And then the absorbing, just touching that substance um, is going to be the, the slowest still, just because generally your skin is going to be a pretty good barrier. Um, so most things aren't going to be able to, to make it through. Um, but with that, I am going to have a, uh, an additional video in the, the extra resources for this module. Um, and it's going to be a video about a, um, a scientist that got two drops of organic mercury on her gloves. Um, and then ultimately she unfortunately died, but it kind of walks through the exact process of how, how that occurred. Um, even though she was wearing gloves, even though it was only two drops, um, it kind of walks through the, the, entire, um, the entire process there. And then um, with this, with those exposures, we want to think about um, how that could also differ for people within the, the same environment. Um, so when we're drinking water, if there's a toxin in that, that's going to be the, the same for everybody but some people may be drinking more water than others. Um, same thing with uh, just the, the air quality. You're gonna be breathing at different amounts. Smaller children typically are gonna be breathing heavier, breathing more often um, than adults. Food, uh, the, the more you eat, the more you're gonna be exposed if there's something in that. Um, but also one thing to think about is just sort of the, the, the behaviors of people. Um, and what that I mean is if you had, uh, let's say if there was a family in a, uh, a living room or something, and then there was some toxin, I don't know, whatever it's gonna be. If you just think about what each of those different people may be doing, there may be one person just sitting on the couch, just kind of hanging out, doing nothing. There may be one toddler kind of crawling around the, the floor, picking up the toys, putting a bunch of things in his mouth. Um, and then there may be one person that just kind of goes outside to hang out there. So because they're all going to be doing slightly different things, even though they're basically in the, the same location, they're going to be exposed to, to slightly different, um, different levels of contaminants and maybe even potentially different contaminants uh, entirely. And then with that, we also want to remember 
um, or I guess since it was we haven't discussed it here, um, if you just think about children, babies typically are going to be smaller than uh, most adults. Um, obviously, it's not always the case, but typically, since they're going to be the, the smaller um, human beings, they're just naturally going to be more susceptible to toxins just because on a, a body weight basis, it's going to have a, a greater effect um, just based on the, the relative body weights. Um, so if you think about it, if I'm like 160 pounds versus a, a baby that may be eight pounds, if we're exposed to the, the same level of toxin, I have 20 times the, the body mass to kind of um, spread out whatever that effect's going to be. So it's not going to be as drastic. If it's something really bad, we're probably both done for, but if it's not something um, super terrible, my body's going to be able to more easily sort of absorb whatever that, that negative effect's going to be. Um, but then also with the, the children, they're still developing. So that's why um, oftentimes with the, especially neurotoxins, that's why they're going to be um, particularly bad for, for children because their brain's still developing. So it's really going to negatively impact that cognitive function. Um, and then one theory for why there's fewer serial killers. Um, and I don't know exactly, I don't know if this is true. I would expect there's probably some truth to it and I would expect there's probably other factors as well. Um, but why there's fewer serial killers um, now than there was uh, like in the, the 1970s, 1960s. Um, like I said, I would guess it's probably multiple reasons like improvements in technology um, and just sort of the, the communication between different uh, law enforcement agencies um, and things like that. But one hypothesized reason is the, the removal of lead from gasoline. So you may see that is now unleaded gasoline because in the, the past, they did have lead in it and that lead was gonna get into the atmosphere. It's gonna be something that people were gonna be breathing and that's gonna be negative for everybody. There's no safe exposure to lead. Um, but it's again, gonna be particularly harmful for children just because they're smaller, they're still developing. Um, so one, one theory for the, the decrease in serial killers is the, the removal of lead from gasoline ultimately decrease the, the level of lead exposure which uh, improve the, the childhood development by improving their, their cognitive function um, and then decreasing some of those violent tendencies. Uh, again, I don't know exactly if that's true or how true it is, it's just a, a theory, um, but I think it does make a little bit of sense at least. I wouldn't say that's the 100% only reason, but I think it makes a little bit of sense that that, that could be part of the reason. Uh, but again, technology is definitely gonna play a big role in that too. And then for the, the next piece, which uh, I also talked about a little bit in the, the pesticide uh, lecture, um, but we've got what's known as bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Both of those are gonna be very similar processes in that we're gonna see the amount of a, a pollutant, amount of a toxin um, increase, but it's gonna be different just in terms of sort of the, the scale that we're focused on. Because with bioaccumulation, we're just gonna be looking at one organism over time so if you think about the um, seafood is often, um, or actually this wasn't the, the pesticide lecture, this was just the, the chapter seven lecture, um, but seafood, sometimes you may hear there's uh, sort of recommendations on the, the frequency with which you should eat seafood. Uh, because with the, the seafood, there's gonna be in some cases uh, different contaminants in the, the water. So as the, the fish is swimming around there, if it's going to be a, a persistent chemical, if it's going to be a, a fat soluble chemical, it's going to be a chemical that's liable to, to accumulate. It's going to be a chemical that's going to increase in concentration in that organism. So just over time, the amount of it's going to build, uh, just build up and up. Um, and then biomagnify is a, a similar idea. It's just now, instead of looking at one organism, we're looking at how that, that, um, that pollutant, that contaminant, how the, the amount of it, how the concentration of it is gonna increase as we go up the, the, the food web. So as we go to a higher trophic level, we're gonna see the, the relative amount, the concentration of that substance is now gonna be increased. Uh, and the, the reason for that is because again, as the, just over time, we're gonna see it bioaccumulate in every substance or every species, I should say. Um, but then when we get to the, the food web, 
now we're gonna have a whole bunch of the um like the phytoplankton or whatever the the basis of this food web is going to be is going to be exposed to some of that that contaminant but now the the primary consumers are going to eat that uh that plankton they're going to now absorb basically take in some of that uh contaminant from the, the plankton now the the seals are then going to eat the fish they're going to get even more of that contaminant that way and then finally the the polar bears are going to eat the the seals so we're going to see even more of that contaminant start to bar, uh, biomagnify so that's why bioaccumulation we're just looking at one organism over time biomagnify we're just looking at the the concentration of that substance increasing as we get to the, the top of the uh the food web because we're seeing it accumulate in all of these um species but then since the fish eat the plankton it's essentially like they're absorbing all of that um contaminant and now the the seal eats the the fish so now it's like it's getting all of the the contaminant from those previous two and then the the same thing with the uh the polar bear at the top because the the contaminant level is basically staying the same at each um each one but the the biomass itself is decreasing so the amount of organism is decreasing so that's why we're just seeing it magnify but again, this is going to occur with persistent and uh, fat soluble compounds, because with the, the persistent portion of it, that allows those contaminants to, to stick around, that allows them to actually be exposed to these organisms. If it wasn't persistent, it would break down pretty quickly, either through a reaction with water, a uh, reaction in the air, uh, by sunlight, whatever it is. Um, so it would degrade pretty quickly. And it's not going to be able to accumulate then. And then the, the fat soluble portion of it, um, if it wasn't fat soluble, now those organisms are just going to um, relatively quickly uh, just excrete it through its waste. But with the, the fat soluble portion of it, that's going to allow that, um, that substance to make its way through the, the membrane into the, the fatty tissues of those organisms. And then once it's in those fatty tissues, it can stay there for years and years and years and just really start to build up and up and up. And that's why we start to see the, the seal. You can really see starting to get a, a lot of that contaminant and then the, the polar bear even more because the, the higher we get in this trophic level, the higher we get in that food web, the more we're gonna see it magnify. Um, and then we've talked about it uh, a couple of times even in this uh, lecture, um, but we didn't go through it specifically. But the, the reason that the, the silent spring occurred is going to be because of this biomagnification process and it's going to be because of the, the the chemical ddt so it was sprayed a whole bunch in order to prevent the, the spread of malaria and typhus um, but what they saw was very very small concentration in water but then the, the zooplankton were always floating around that water so it started to accumulate bioaccumulate there the, the small fish would then eat those uh, zooplankton started to biomagnify now. Same thing with the, the larger fish started to really biomagnify. And then these fish eating birds are taking those uh, larger fish that are packed full of this DDT. And now they're getting super exposed to it. It's really biomagnified at the top now. And that's ultimately why the, the, the silent spring occurred. These birds at the, the top of the, the food web um, ultimately were just dying, unable to produce offspring. So they just weren't there to um, Silent Spring just sing the the song that they you would normally um, uh, you would normally relate with uh, just birds in the, the springtime. Uh, and then with these toxins, uh, if you think about it, there's a potential for there to be just an infinite an, uh, amount of them really in the environment. Um, so when we're looking at toxins, we Kind of characterize them into a couple of different classes in terms of short term versus long term. Um, so acute versus chronic. And then we can use this in terms of the, the effect or the exposure. That, um, so acute is just looking at sort of a, a short term one time thing. Or if it's the, the symptoms, we're only going to have those symptoms for a short period of time. But with these acute ones, since we're only exposed once or we're only exposed for a short period of time, we're typically going to see the, the dosage or the exposure is going to be much, much higher. And then the, the chronic ones, these are going to be ones that are typically going to be um, sort of longer term 
we're going to be exposed constantly, but we're going to be exposed at very, very small, or not very, very small levels, um, but smaller amounts typically. Um, and then because of that, we're not going to typically see just symptoms like boom right away. It's going to be something that's going to either gradually increase over time, or it may eventually get to a point where you sort of hit a tipping point and then start to see the, the symptoms. Um, but with these, uh, we try to take into account both of these whenever we're thinking about the, the safety, particularly with the, the safety of um, workers. So there's a, a whole bunch of different regulations and things that factor in um, acute and chronic exposure to different substances. Um, so the acute exposure, those limits are higher just because you're going to be exposed for a shorter amount of time. But then if it's going to be something that you may have to deal with for a longer period of time, the exposure limits are going to be shorter, uh, smaller, rather. Um, but hopefully the regulations in place are put in place just to delimit exposure completely or to do it in a, a totally safe manner. So you may have heard of OSHA, for example. Um, so even in addition to sort of chemical exposure, there's also things just with general like workplace safety that can kind of roll into the same sort of thing. But obviously we're gonna be focused just on sort of the, the chemical aspect of it um, rather than dealing with like ladders or something like that. Uh, but with these risk uh, assessments, because we need to know the, the level of risk in order to, to properly sort of come up with the, the plan, um, these risk assessments uh, usually are performed on lab animals, um, sometimes clinical trials and things like that for, for pharmaceuticals and stuff. When you get to the, the, like the, the end phase, then they do human trials. Um, but especially at the, the beginning or especially when they're doing what are um, going to result in these types of curves, these dose response curves, um, those are always going to be using lab animals. Um, and then with those, there's a couple of concerns with them. One, they're expensive and they're time consuming. They're also often reactionary. Um, so a lot of the times we don't do, uh, at least with, with pharmaceuticals, we at least, um, they, they have to um, go through the process at least beforehand to try to show that it's safe. Um, but with a lot of consumer products, they don't really need to do that um, until there's a sort of evidence that it may be harmful. Um, and then, like I said, these experiments, these processes are expensive and lengthy. And then in addition to that, there's the, the ethical concerns of performing these uh, types of trials on uh, lab animals. Um, and then there's also no clear relationship between humans and other species. So there's some that do seem to work pretty well, um, but you can't say for certain that if a, uh, a, mite, a mouse died at this concentration, how does that uh, extrapolate to humans? And then often what they do with these is they um, are extrapolating quite a bit from the, the data. So sometimes you can not also be quite 100% certain um, sort of in what they're in some of these values. Uh, in general, they do, do a pretty good job and there is really no good alternative, um, but there are definitely some, some issues with these. And then depending on the, the shape of that um, dose response curve, so it's saying effect here, but we can still think of it as uh, the response. Um, depending on the, the shape of that response curve, um, it tells us a little bit something, gives us more information about exactly the, um, gives us more information about that, that toxin. Um, so for A, for example, if we look, you see it's just one straight line going through the, the origin. And this is showing that no matter what the, the concentration is, the effect's always gonna increase linear, linearly. So if we add a little bit more, we're always gonna get a little bit more of a response. For the, the next two though, we can see even without a dose, we're gonna get a little bit of a response. Um, and then for B, as we add more, it's not gonna change it at all initially. So there's gonna be sort of a, uh, a minimum threshold where nothing's gonna happen. But then once we get past that threshold, then we start to see it increase linearly. C, we can kind of see there's gonna be a tipping point where as we add more of it, we're actually gonna see less of whatever that response is for whatever reason. But then we hit a, a tipping point, whereas we continue to then add even more, that response, that effect starts to come back. 
Um, D would be an example of something that's going to be um, very poisonous in uh, very small doses if we're thinking about the, the effect um, being actual death. Because if you look, it shoots up pretty quickly, representing that it's only going to take a small amount of the substance in order to get that response in a, a large portion of the, the population. And then for the, um, this is just kind of a, a weird one. You're always going to have some sort of effect. Doesn't really change too much as you add a little bit. Then you finally hit a threshold though, and then you're going to see it shoot up. Um, but with this one, what I want to point out is, um, and then the same thing with C really, um, this could be an example of sort of a medicine where it's going to be effective for a portion. There's going to be some dosage where you're going to get the, the desired amount or the desired response. Same thing here, depending on what the, the effect is, you could kind of have the, the positive thing going up or down. Um, but you're going to get some of that response for a while. And then you're going to hit a threshold where it's going to sort of reverse. Um, so in that case, we can see something going from a medicine to becoming a poison. Um, and then with this, there are things like uh, micronutrients and uh, substances like that, where you do need them in small amounts, but then if you get too much of them, it will be harmful for you. Um, and then in addition to just how we assess the, the risk, one thing we should think about is just the, the perception of risk, because there are um, a bunch of different factors, just like everything in this course, but a bunch of different factors in terms of even if we know what the, the risk is, exactly how that's going to impact our actions. Um, the, the easiest ones are just gonna be social, political, and economic factors. So if a, a company stands uh, the chance to make a lot of money, they're probably gonna be more comfortable taking some sort of risk. Whereas a, um, an environmental group that really wants to protect whatever that uh, ecosystem may be, they're going to be less comfortable taking that risk. Uh, so things like fracking um, could be an example where the, the corporation is comfortable risking the, the environment um, because they stand to make the money from that process. But then the, the community or environmental groups may not want to take that risk because they're not going to see that, that economic benefit. They're more focused on the environmental factors. Um, so depending on sort of what we're more interested in, that's going to, to shape how we, we um, how we perceive that risk. Similarly, how involved we are. If the, the community you live in is the, the site for a potential, um, potential mine or something like that, something that could uh, cause a, an environmental issue, you may be more interested in stopping that. You may, be, you may cons consider it more of a risk than if this occurs across the state or across the country, something that's further away from you. Um, similarly, just understanding probability sometimes makes it difficult for uh, people to understand the, the risk. So if thinking about just flipping a coin, got a 50-50 chance to get heads or tails, but just because I flip it the, the first time and get he heads doesn't mean the second time I'm going to get tails. It's still a 50-50 shot for that second one. Um, so sometimes with probability, and especially just with statistics in general, um, sometimes it can be difficult to fully understand what those are saying, um, especially if they're being reported from somebody with bias, you can kind of sometimes manipulate them um, and twist those statistics a little bit. Uh, and then somewhat similarly, we have uh, irrational fear. So things like nuclear power plants typically get sort of a bad rap just because of nuclear weapons. They kind of all funder, fall under that same umbrella of the, the potential for a, uh, like a nuclear apocalypse. Uh, but nuclear power plants, at least in the, the US, have zero known deaths associated with them. Whereas coal power plants, something that people are typically much more comfortable with, um, are going to have many more deaths associated with them. And that's going to um, combine the, the deaths from the, the mining operation, um, just shipping that coal across the country, as well as the, the combustion. Uh, and then just any of the, the myths, fallacies, and conspiracy, you can always kind of find somebody that's going to be yelling something weird on some street corner. Uh, about pretty much any topic. Um, so you always have to be careful where you're getting that information from because some people are going to 
to, to try to twist that information or focus on just different pieces of it in order to support their their idea their their um, their side of the argument. Um, and that can be to either make the, the risk seem greater than it is or less than it is, depending on what perspective they're coming from, depending on what they're trying to achieve. Um, that could be in either different group. Um, so I consider myself an environmentalist. Um, so I would generally be in support of things that are going to protect the environment. But with that, you do um, just to kind of give you the, the other perspective that I sometimes may provide and may not provide you with explicitly. Um, but you do sometimes see environmental groups uh, kind of going even more extreme, uh, kind of going overboard with sort of making the, the risk seem worse than it is just because they're so interested in protecting that environment. Um, so you can kind of see it from both sides. Uh, typically though, you do see it from um, not too much from the environmental perspective. But then in terms of how much risk is actually accessible, acceptable rather, um, the, the EPA, the ones that kind of define this, um, they've determined that one in 1 million chance of an envi uh, environmental hazard is an acceptable risk. So one times 10 to the sixth, um, or one over 10 to the sixth, really. And with this, the, the way they kind of came about that is it's a, a balance of uh, a whole bunch of different factors. Again, everything in this course is going to be a balance of these different factors. Um, but we need to consider the, the environmental protection, making sure what we're doing is actually going to protect the environment, protect the, the people in that environment, protect the other organisms, the, the plants, just the, the ecosystem as a whole, make sure hopefully that it's sustain, uh, sustainable going forward. We need to consider the, the social aspects. Um, so how is that going to impact the, the people that live there? How is that going to impact the, the activities that support their, um, their survival, their lifestyles in some cases? Uh, the economics, again, always plays a big role. We need the, the money to do something, and we also need the, the money on the, the side of whatever we're going to be doing. Um, often that's going to be kind of at odds with the, the environmental aspect of it. A lot of the times the, the corporations, um, what's going to make them money isn't always going to what, be what's protecting the, the environment. So we got to kind of balance um, both sides of that coin. Uh, and then of course, politically, uh, I mentioned it in the, the previous um, lecture, I think, uh, I think it was chapter seven, um, but with the, the EPA, just looking at the, the changes you see when the, the different presidents are in power, um, when they get to kind of appoint their own uh, people in the EPA, you can see the, the, the priorities they have for different things. Um, so that's always gonna influence it uh, as well. But with the, the EPA, the way they kind of um, establish the, the different thresholds for different substances uh, is just based on that one in one million uh, acceptable risk. <laughs> So if everybody was exposed to that risk, that level, um, one in one million uh, people would have some sort of uh, negative consequence of it. And then with this, there will be different um, thresholds for different uh, matrices and different substances because the, the different substances are gonna be different um, in terms of their toxicity, but then also the, the matrices. So the sort of what those substances are in is gonna influence their exposure. So drinking water is gonna have a different um, threshold than uh, the concentration in air, just because you're gonna be breathing different amounts of air than you would be drinking water. And then the, the, the routes of exposure for those are gonna be different as well. And then just the, the last thing, we're not gonna to go too much into this, um, because it kind of just wraps up with the, the previous slide. Um, but with these health policies, when they're trying to establish what's the, the best way to do it, again, the EPA kind of bases it on one in a million. And that's kind of a uh, combination of the economic and business and environmental, um, social factors all combined into one. And then even with those, um, there are some in the, the science community that think the, the standards are in some cases a little too lenient. Um, so I took an environmental toxicology class uh, when I was in grad school and uh, in Logan, Utah, where that school's located, 
Um, there's very poor air quality just because it's essentially just one giant um, like bowl. It's a it's surrounded pretty much 360 degrees by mountains. So the air gets pretty stagnant. So in the, the winter time when the, the air quality is poor, it just builds up that uh, those pollutants, those contaminants. Um, and one of those contaminants is going to be something known as PM 2.5, which we'll cover in one of the, the later chapters when we focus on air quality. Um, but there's an acceptable standard for PM 2.5 in the, the atmosphere. Um, and that's established based on the, the science as well as the, the economics and those other different factors. Um, but like I was saying, some people in the, the science community think that standard should be even lower than it actually is. Don't think that actually represents that, that one in a million chance. Um, so there is some disagreement on some of those actual thresholds. Um, but with this, we can kind of just see the, the general process. Uh, and the, the reason they have it shown like this is just because it's gonna be a continuous process. Just like with anything in science, as we learn new information, we're gonna change our, our viewpoint, we're gonna change our idea, we're gonna adapt. Um, that's why uh, like flip-flopping, I don't understand why people think that's, I, I, I do get for some things like why you can't just change your mind. Um, but when it comes to gaining new information, it should be totally acceptable to, to change your mind, come up with a new plan. Same thing with COVID. At the beginning of the, the pandemic, there was some, there was some set of information that they were basing their uh, suggestions off of. And then as that changed, they evolved their suggestions. They, they changed the, the recommendations on uh, masking and things like that. The same thing with the, the thresholds for these um, different pollutants. They're going to, to monitor, evaluate, um, and just keep an eye on it. And then as new information comes up, hopefully they would adapt it, either lower those thresholds if they've found that the, the chemicals are more of an issue than previously, previously thought, um, or if there was evidence to su suggest the opposite. Um, typically, doesn't occur as often. Uh, but if there was, then there would be uh, a reason to make it more lenient. Um, but you can kind of just see the, the circular nature of this process. And then if you're wondering exactly who the, the stakeholders would be, um, this is essentially just everybody that's going to be involved uh, in whatever this, this decision is going to be, depending on exactly like what the, the situation that we're, we're focused on is. Um, but this could include the, the politicians, um, special interest groups in the, the area, or just nationally. Um, Sometimes it can be good to have businesses involved, sometimes it can't, um, but they're also gonna be the, the stakeholders um, as well as just local individuals um, and pretty much just anybody else that's gonna be involved in this in some way. Because uh, with these, a lot of the times uh, they do have, maybe not the EPA, um, but like with local governments and things, uh, as they're making different types of uh, health policies related to the environment, they do often take um, suggestions from the public, at least in the, the initial phase. Um, and that will be the, the end of chapter eight, but I will have a couple other videos um, in this module just to, to touch on some other of those topics a little bit more.